Uh, we are now recording. I want to say hey, uh, welcome, everybody, to the webcast. Uh, this webcast is going to be about Python and log analysis and frequency analysis. Um, I'm going to make myself presenter real quick to go over a couple of quick things before I kick it over to Joff, who's going to be the bulk of this webcast. And I'm just going to sit here and be like the guys in the back at a public enemy concert that just do this every once in a while and reposition myself and look badass. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Wild West Hackenfest is coming up. If you guys haven't had a chance to look at that, you really should. Um, our our speaker lineup is is stupid. Uh, it's it's you know, we uh, we basically came up with a list of all of the uh, speakers that I wanted to get in uh, to Wild West Hackenfest, and almost all of them agreed. Um, and the new one uh, that is not on this list. Let me see. Oh, it is. This guy right here, who we don't have a picture, is Ed Scotus. So we know of Ed Scotus uh, coming. Uh, he's going to be presenting as well. We got Sally and Carrie, and Joff is there as well. We got Mike Poor from inside of his microwave. Uh, so we just have some amazing people coming out and uh, just doing some really, really cool presentations. So uh, be sure to check that out. Uh, it's going to be like, I think it's like October 26th and 27th in Deadwood, South Dakota. And it's right before Dead Weird, which is their big Halloween celebration. So it's a huge party in Deadwood. Uh, we're going to bring in a band. We're going to do an open mic night. Well, I'm hoping I can get Deviant to help work out with the uh, open mic night. And maybe maybe I can get you, Joff, to play some things. And maybe uh, maybe I can get to the point where Bo and I will, uh, will actually uh, do some heavy metal for everybody uh, because Bo is a badass at heavy metal and I just scream. So Joff, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm going to make you the presenter. I'm going to stop sharing my webcam. So here we go. Let's kick it off for getting started with Python. So Joff, you have the con. All right. We should. There it is. Now we're ready to go. I'm going to go on mute and kill that background noise, but you sound good. I can see your screen. Take it away. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Um, so welcome everybody. It's good to be here. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, source tracking for log file frequency analysis with Python. That's a really long uh, title for the presentation. Um, let's just say that it was not easy to come up with the titles and we'll just uh, move forward <laughs> at that. Um, as we all, all uh, talked about briefly uh, a moment ago, there's some upcoming uh, SANS uh, teaching events that I will be teaching uh, automating information security with Python. Uh, the SEC 573. The first one here is SANS Northern Virginia in Reston, uh, starting May 21st. And then there's a community SANS in Columbia, Maryland, for anybody that's in the DC, uh, Maryland area, uh, June 12th. And then I have a SANS Cyber Defense uh, teach in Canberra, Australia. So it'll be good to be in, in Australia for a week there uh, and a little bit more to see some family as well. So. With that said, um, what I want to talk about is some um, uh, DNS log file uh, frequency analysis. Uh, we're going to pick on DNS because it's a great thing to pick on. Um, the basic agenda that we're going to talk about today is first a little slide on the challenge itself, or at least a perceived challenge from my perspective. And then, I know you're going to love this, we are going to talk about regular expressions. We're going to talk about testing some regular expressions as well. Uh, we will move from there into talking about Python dictionaries, uh, and then a special dictionary in Python called a counter dictionary, uh, hence the frequency anal analysis theme. Counter dictionaries are very useful for that. And then I'm going to demo the uh, actual Python script that I put together uh, for this webcast so that you can see how we can bring these things together to give us some very useful data out of that um, DNS log query um, source. Okay. So the challenge, excuse me a minute, the challenge, performing frequency analysis on a bind nine DNS log file. Well, everybody, uh, well, I'm sure a lot of people have bind in their environments, especially if you're a large ISP. Um, perhaps even uh, you have bind, uh, bind nine DNS uh, as a split DNS configuration where you might have your uh, internal network, your Windows domain controllers, uh, being the first hop and then bind uh, acting as the split DNS uh, second uh, hop in the DNS configuration. So if we have a bind DNS query log, we can enable that in the bind configuration um, in the name d.conf file um, by uh, selecting queries in the categories and logging them to a specific file. And we're going to get a format um, that's going to include for ourselves 
the querying client address itself, um, the DNS resource record type query, resource record types such as um, TXT or SRC or A records or quad A's or C names or you know SRV records, right? We're also going to get the resource record name itself query. And then just to pipe, pump it up at just another level, um, the configuration that I used, which is somewhat sanitized data, is actually my own DNS. And I have a split DNS in a single DNS configuration. Uh, so don't attack me, uh, please. Uh, with an internal and external view inside that split DNS. So that's what we're going to use as the source data for our, our coding uh, and our experimenting. All right, before we go there though, we need to talk about regular expressions, right? And there's the favorite XKCD argument about, uh, sorry, a cartoon about Perl, right? If you're having Perl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I've got 99 problems, so I went ahead and used regular expressions. And now I've got 100 problems, right? Always funny. Anyway, it's not really that bad, but you do have to document them. So what's a regular expression? Well, a regular expression is a string that defines a pattern to match other strings. What's that? A foreign language. No, not really. Okay. Regular expressions are fantastic. They're very, very highly efficient, but they're quite difficult to read. Uh, many people, just like Perl, and this is an opinion, say that regular expressions are a write-only language. Um, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, if you don't document a regular expression, you're going to be very sad when you come back three or six months later and you try to work out what exactly that regular expression is doing. However, if we need to extract meaningful pieces of data from large groups of data, such as log files, right? Regular expressions are very, very useful. We implement regular expressions in Python using the RE module. Import RE would be the statement in a Python script to use the regular expression module and library. It's very, very common for people to use re.findall method in Python. That is a method that returns a list back to you, which is relatively easy to manipulate. However, we want to take that a little bit further. Let's understand some rules of regular expressions and some functions first. First of all, the functions. Find all we just mentioned where we pass in a regular expression and then a string to find occurrences in a string. Uh, and then we return all of that as a list in Python, a list data structure. That's useful, but not nearly as useful as match and search. Match starts at the beginning of a string and extracts as much out of that string as possible, returning a custom regular expression object Search also does a very similar thing. However, it can match a regular expression anywhere in the string. The special object that is returned that is useful in Python uh, is, has an attribute called group. Uh, this group app attribute is what allows us to extract out different portions of the match for a regular expression. Okay. Some of the rules of regular expressions will first of all, Regular expressions always move left to right on a string. So you've got to think of regular expressions as, as if you were reading a book. So if you look at this first example, we have re.findall sans in the sans Python class rocks because, well, it does, right? That returns ourselves a list with just the single element sans. A regular expression can just be an exact match on a, on a specific string, for example. Right? But we also have regular expressions that have sets in them. A special set that you can see in this slide is the backslash w set, backslash lowercase w, which means in regular expression speak, any text character, a through z, a through z uppercase, zero through nine, and the underscore, but no special characters. Similarly, there are another expression uh, for regular expressions called backslash uppercase w. That's a, a an opposite of the original set backslash lowercase w, which gives us the exact inverse of that match. There are other particular sets that we can get into. We're not going to go too deep other than to talk a little bit about the custom sets. Backslash d, for example, matches digits. Backslash uppercase d is the opposite of digits. Backslash s for white space character. Backslash b for borders of characters. Uh, a couple of special entities here, the carrot or the hat, 
matches from the start of a search string and the dollar matches to the end of a search string. Okay. N another special character, which I didn't mention on the last slide, is just the single period in a regular expression. The single period by itself matches any possible character. That is a wild card in a regular expression. If we actually want to match a period itself, we don't want the wildcard match, then we need to be able to put a backslash in front of that period so that we escape the match and say we want to specifically match that period character. More useful for us in regular expressions are custom sets. So if you look at backslash D, if you look at backslash W, backslash S, these things are actually predefined sets within regular expressions. But what if we want some more specificity in the way that we define our regular expression? Maybe we only want the characters A through Z in uppercase. Maybe we only want the characters A through Z in lowercase. This is when we can use custom sets. Okay? In the case of the slide that's given, we have a date match that we're trying to perform. In this case, the date 99 slash 99 slash 99 would be considered a valid date if we just used backslash D to match any digit. However, if we define a custom set as here on the lower portion of the slide, where we have the square bracket 01 and then backslash D, we're asking the regular expression engine to match two digits where the first of those two digits can only be in the set zero and one. This is where custom sets become very, very useful for refining our pencil and sharpening the way that we match with a regular expression. John, if you want to rib me at any point and jump in with crazy questions, you can. <laughs> no, I'm just sitting here. Um, Erica is actually listening in. And uh, oh she's, <laughs> she's like, wow, this sounds like techie geeky stuff. So she's all over it. Um, <laughs> there were some people that were asking some questions about whether or not the slides would be available. I, I think that we can. We can't get the slide notes, um, but we can uh, release the slides to people. Uh, they are SANS slides from a real SANS class. And, um, and uh, that's kind of the big question that seems to be circulating around quite a bit. So that's it. Nothing really big at all. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll, double, we'll double check on that to make sure. Um, but as John, just to reinforce, this is uh, a subset of uh, slides uh, from a SEC 573 course. So uh, we'll see what we can do there. Some of them are my slides, some of them are not. So great. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. So what if we want to repeat characters in regular expressions? Okay. It's a little, you know, sort of going back to the previous slide for a minute. If we have two digits we want to match, backslash D, backslash D, um, it's a little bit repetitive to continue, have, continue having to put each individual character in that regular expression into the expression itself. If we wanted, say, a hundred of those or five of those, what we really want to be able to do is use some repeating characters to give us a little bit more definition into um, mandating how many digits we want to uh, match. Okay, so if we wanted to use maybe a hundred backslash D characters, we can use the curly braces to specify exactly how many copies of the previous character we want to match. So in this particular case, if we wanted a hundred backslash D characters, we could do backslash D curly brace 100 close curly brace, and we would match exactly 100 of the digit characters. If we wanted a variable number, maybe we wanted one or more of the previous character, we can use a repeating character in the regular expression uh, of plus. So in the case you see on the slide, we have a regular expression that starts to match a URL and you can see the exact string HTTP colon slash slash and then a set definition. In the set definition, we've said backslash W meaning any text character. We've also said backslash period, meaning the exact match of a period should be in this set. We've also said backslash backslash, meaning we want the exact match of a backslash being in this set, as well as a forward slash. And then we've put a plus character after that set, saying we want one or more of this particular set in the match. So that by that, you can see we're trying to match something that roughly looks like a domain. 
Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that my dog snored behind me right as I said that. No, that's not actually the interesting thing, but he really did do that. Um, there is a lowercase r in front of that regular expression you can see here on the screen. And some of you might be wondering, this is right with the line re.findall, some of you might be wondering what that lowercase r actually means. What it means for Python is it is to treat the regular expression string as if it were a raw string. In other words, treat the regular expression string as something that we want to feed directly into the regular expression engine and not have the Python string object modify the string in any possible way. For example, you might imagine that some strings have special characters in them, like a backslash n for a new line or a backslash r for a carriage return. We don't want Python to reinterpret any of those escape sequences when we're trying to create a regular expression. We want to feed that data directly into the regular expression engine. And in order to tell Python not to modify that data in any possible way, that's when we use this little lowercase r in front of a string to mo not modify the string, just feed it directly into the regular expression engine. Hope that makes some sense for you. Um, some other things. Uh, the uh, asterisk or star means to match zero or more of the previous character. Instead of one or more, we're saying zero or more of the previous match. And then there's an extra um, syntax of the curly braces where we do x comma y. We could do, for example, one comma three, which means match one of these characters up to maximum of three any of the previous character that we have in the regular expression. So you can see we have quite a lot of flexibility in the way that we match stuff as we're creating our regular expressions. There's another concept that we need to build out before we start going to code and that's called capturing groups. Within Python regular expressions and also most other regular expressions in other languages, we have the concept of a capturing group. When we use parentheses in a regular expression, that means to create a match for that regular expression and capture that in a special group as a separate entity. In the example of re.findall, these things get captured into their own uh, tuple as part of the resulting list. You can see in the slide here, when we had a capturing um, subgroup inside of that regular expression, we got tuples of each individual uh, sequence of digits that were in the uh, regular expression. Uh, we did not get, for example, the href equals and the backslash, um, sorry, and the double quote or the single quote. Okay, so this is how we group data in our returned match so that we can use that group to our advantage. Just like find all, more flexibly, search and match actually return an object with a group method that provides us with the results and provides us with a way of getting at these different groups. If we call uh, the dot group method on the re resulting object from a regular expression match, we are able to extract those subgroups by digit. For in the same example as, as last time, we had this re.search for all of these different digits, and then we looked for results.group, that returned the entire first match. But when we looked for results.group with the parentheses two, notice how we got the second set of the digits that were in the original regular expression. In this case, we passed at an IP address of 192.168.100.100, and by calling the results.group two, we extracted out the second set of three digits from the captured group. Hey, that uh, makes a question. little bit of sense. Yes, question. We have a couple of questions. Um, first, Jordan asked, this is all well and good for ASCII DNS logs, but I'm curious how you'd have to modify this to identify Unicode DNS requests. Okay, very good question, uh, Jordan. Uh, for uh, Unicode DNS, there's a couple of different things that you could do. Uh, one is that you could do, use the Python codex module to convert the uh, input um, from Unicode back to ASCII as you're reading the data. Um, alternatively, you can try to treat the strings as Unicode in the regular expressions, but that's going to be a much more challenging 
uh, way to go. So I would suggest converting the Unicode back to ASCII as you're processing uh, the data you're trying to look at. Very good. And then, David, and then David had a question. He said, is the little r only for Python regex, or is it part of any regex library? Okay, very good question. Yeah, the little r is only a Python construct uh, to convert a string to a raw string. It is, it is not for other regular expression libraries, just for Python. And then Chris, I thought, brought up a very good question. Um, and, and, you know, I hope he understands that when we're talking about these classes, we have to talk about the common use case. But he said, why does everyone forget port numbers when parsing URLs with regular expressions? Um, because they are um, not thinking ahead, uh, first of all, in my opinion. Um, there is a concept in regular expressions called an optional match. Uh, and so if you wanted to create um, a regular expression that matched a URL and had colon port number on the end of that URL, I would subgroup the colon port number into a captured group and then put a question mark after the expression, which indicates that the um, port number is going to be an optional match. Very good question. All right, great. Let's uh, move forward again. Thanks for the questions, John. I appreciate it. Uh, there's another concept which I need to get across uh, before we go to code, and that is to uh, capture named groups. So while using the dot group method to index the gr uh, captured groups uh, in your regular expression by number is useful, it's actually not very meaningful. And so when you're writing Python code, if you can actually name your regular expression groups with this uh, construct of question mark p and the less than and the greater than inside of the uh, group, uh, in, uh, the group uh, part of the regular expression, you can name the actual result. And by naming the actual result, then you can refer to it using the group method by name instead of by number. So in this particular example, we created a named group that had an area code as part of the match that was designed to match a telephone number. The area co code is a named group inside the uh, uh, regular expression and when we actually match that regular expression against a phone number we can then refer to that named group as area code within quotes when we try to use the result. Very nice way of being able to do things. One other thing I should point out here, in this particular um, regular expression that's um, higher up on the screen where the yellow tags are, you will notice that there is a set with a single quote and then a double quote in the set. The double quote has a backslash in front of it because it is escaping it as part of the uh, regular expression so that the string doesn't terminate inside of Python. So I don't want people to get hung up on that. That really is a set of a single quote and a double quote in this particular example. Okay, so I thought I'd throw another XKCD cartoon in there. Regex golf, right, which is sort of what we're, we're playing here. You try to match one group but not the other, right? So I wrote a little program that plays regex golf with arbitrary lists, but I lost my code and I'm grepping for files that look like regex golf. So <laughs> <laughs> solvers. Um, yeah, okay, so we've got infinite problems. Yeah, it's a fun kind of thing. Right, so, talking about groups, Greg just had a question. He said, can I combine named groups in one regular expression? Uh, you can certainly combine named groups in re one regular expression. You can have multiple named groups in that regular expression, and uh, in addition to that, you can even back reference named groups if you have something that's delimited, for example, where you could have a regular expression that matched the beginning of, let's say, a URL, for example. Um, maybe the beginning of that URL is a double quote or a single quote, and then you could have a back reference that referenced the first match so that you can find that same delimiter on the second match. Hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Okay. Well, having talked about regular expressions just a little bit, we haven't covered it comprehensively necessarily. Of course, I'm all hoping that you want to come to the Python class uh, to hear the comprehensive coverage at some point. Uh, we're also going to talk about Python dictionaries just a little bit so that we can introduce the log analysis code that I've put together for this uh, short talk. So in Python, dictionaries are 
similar to uh, lists in some way, but they have the concept of being able to index data inside of a data structure by name instead of by number. Okay, I am certainly assuming that some of you have some Python knowledge because we've jumped into some relatively advanced topics, but it's it's quite difficult to pace a talk like this without making that assumption. So I hope you forgive, forgive me for that. But if you look at uh, lists, just for starters, up top here we have a slide list one equals ABC in square brackets, and then we have three uh, string Python objects inside that list. Whenever we defined a list in Python, we use the square brackets. And when we try to reference element zero of that list, which will be the very first element, we would see the Python string object of a single character A. Unlike lists, though, with dictionaries, we can specify an actual key as the index to that dictionary. And that key, interestingly, can be any Python object. That key can be a complex data structure, not just a string. But we're not gonna take it that far. We're gonna stick to keys that are just strings. These are very, very similar to hash tables or associative arrays in other languages. So in this example, uh, and in Python uh, generally, we use the curly braces to define a dictionary. So we have dict1 equals quote first quote colon a, which means create an entry that populates this dictionary with a string key of first and it points it to the value of a. And then put a second entry in this dictionary with a string key of second and have the value of that key be a b, b a b, that sounds like redundant, right? The way we retrieve the dictionary entry in Python is we reference the entry in a similar way to a list syntax. We say dict one square bracket, and then we provide it the key and we should be able to retrieve the value by referencing that dictionary, okay? So dictionaries are essentially an unordered data structure where a given key that we pass in produces the matching data. The interesting thing about a dictionary is once we create these entities, they're extremely high performance, they're extremely fast in Python, and they allow us to do things uh, with key elements that are more interesting than just digits. You might imagine an IP address could be the key into a dictionary, or a DNS query name could be the key into a dictionary, or a DNS query type could be the key into the dictionary, right? So dictionaries are very, very useful Python objects, and they're extremely fast at storing and retrieving data back from Python when we're using them. So here's a couple of quick examples. Here we have a dictionary that we created on the left-hand side of the slide, where we just created an empty dictionary for starters, where we say D equals open curly brace, cl close curly brace, that gives us an empty dictionary object. And then we can try to assign different string objects into that dictionary by saying D square bracket A in quotes, close square bracket equals alpha. And just for interest, by the way, and uh, a little bit of trivia here, whether you use a single quote or a double quote in Python doesn't really matter. Uh, it's up to you. I typically use single quotes in my code. Uh, but they are basically mean the same thing unless Great. you have a, no. a complex no, string. Now you're setting ahead. off a holy war job. You're just stepping right in it. You know, single quotes <laughs> versus double quotes, tabs versus spaces. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'm not going to get into tabs. That's going to be a tricky one. <laughs> yeah. So we've got we've got a we've got a couple of uh, questions. Does anything else start at one like group instead of re or group listing in re? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, typically not. Most objects in Python, whether they're lists, um, you know, whether they're tuples, uh, whether they're let's see if I can think of another example. Um, oh, nothing's coming to me immediately. Most of them count from zero. Uh, well, slices in strings is another thing. It also counts from zero. Uh, the regular expression group method is is a little bit unique in that respect. Okay. Um, another quick thing, and this is this is something that we probably should explain. Michael said, is the pace of today's class reflective of the pace of the SANS class? And I think what people need to understand is there's a tremendous amount of hands-on in the SANS class, like you guys go through a series of concepts like this. 
then there's a lot of time spent uh, going through and getting your hands dirty and working through these concepts. So yeah, it goes fast, but there's a tremendous amount of hands-on to articulate the concepts. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, just to double down on that, I'm loading you up with some material here that will lead us into talking about the script that I'm going to show you. Um, the pace in this talk is probably a little faster than uh, SANS classes typically. Uh, and as John said, we have a lot, just a tremendous amount of practice when we're actually teaching this material in terms of labs that helps reinforce it. And I love David's comment. He said he's using Bash for Windows, by the way, that's awesome, and installed <laughs> Python, and he's able to follow along with the examples real time. So that, that's just very, very, very cool. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Something a little bit unique about dictionaries, just to sort of continue the material getting us to script, uh, is that if you try to access a key inside of a dictionary that does not exist in that dictionary, you actually get a traceback error from Python. You ac Python actually throws an exception. Uh, that's what a traceback is. However, there is a second method in dictionaries that you can use to check if a key exists without throwing a traceback error, which gives you a little bit more flexibility in the way that you code things. And that second method is to use d.get, where d is the dictionary that you're uh, manipulating. And if you try to get a key that doesn't exist in that second method, what actually happens is Python returns the, uh, a null object or a none object, uh, saying that the key doesn't exist, but it doesn't force a traceback error. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility in the way that you code. Either way is acceptable because you can actually catch exceptions in Python. Uh, in the uh, case of the left side of the uh, screen here, from my perspective anyway. Uh, but uh, if you prefer to do an if test on the return value, you can certainly do it with the uh, get method as well. So more to the point, there is a specialized uh, dictionary that you can use for the purposes that we need today. There is a module in Python called the collections module, which has several really, really cool special purpose dictionaries that have modified behavior. One of them is the ordered dict. You have to say T very carefully on these slides, right? One is the ordered dict, which is a dictionary that remembers the order keys were inserted. Remember I said uh, in the dictionary slide a couple back that dictionaries are typically unordered data structures. So you might have a reason to remember the order that they are inserted. Maybe you want to uh, iterate through that dictionary and bring the keys back in sorted order, for example, right? We also have the concept of a default dictionary. This dictionary enables you to specify a default value for undefined keys. So in the case of a default dictionary, if you try to access a value that is not in the dictionary already, what Python will do is create a new key and set the value of that new key entry to be the default value that you supply in a special function. This is known as a default dictionary. The third example, which we're going to use for our log analysis that's really, really useful, is called a counter dictionary. A counter dictionary is actually a special case of a default dictionary. It's a dictionary that automatically counts the number of times that a key inside the dictionary is set. You can think of it in terms of being a default dictionary where the special function that returns the default value is actually returning a zero, an integer zero, when you start to access a method inside that dictionary. But a counter dictionary actually takes that concept a little bit further. Not only does it return zero when you try to access a value that doesn't exist in the dictionary, it also has some special methods that enable you to count the frequency of items inside any data that you pass to the update method, which is a nice, really, really nice special property of a counter dictionary. So in this case on the slide, we're defining a counter dictionary by saying WRD CNT equals counter, open parentheses, close parentheses, that, that actually instantiates an object of the counter collections uh, dictionary, 
Okay, then we're using a special method of that counter object called update, which actually accepts a list and allows you to count all of the items in that list as keys in the dictionary. It will actually update the dictionary with every single element of that list and a count of how many of those elements are in the, in the dictionary. It's a very, very powerful and fast method of a counter dictionary. So in this particular case, you can see there's also a method called most underscore common that gives you the greatest count of all the words in this dictionary. Plus, you can access any element in the dictionary by its key and retrieve the value that indicates the count of that element that's in the dictionary. Really fantastic functionality there that allows us to, in a very, very quick way, create frequency counts. There's another method in the counter dictionary called subtract, which allows you to pass in a list as well, and then subtracts from the total count every element that appears in that list that is a key of that dictionary. Super, super cool way of counting the frequency of items. And so now you might imagine where I'm headed with this concept. It's coding time. So one really fun thing in Python, if you try to import anti-gravity, Python takes you to um, a uh, really cool XKCD cartoon uh, that says how you're going to fly with Python. So everybody should do that at least once just for fun giggles and grins, right? Import anti-gravity. The coding we're about to do, I actually made available in a Bitbucket repo. At the bottom of the slide, you can see I have a thing called bind9 underscore logstat. Sorry about that. That is an underscore in the URL. I know you can't see that in the URL too easily. So uh, make a note of that URL. Everything we talk about in the code is in that repo today that we can actually use to our advantage. Okay. At this point, I'm going to bring up a Linux Unix uh, shell window, hopefully, uh, if I can escape out of my slideshow really quick. Okay. And we're going to try uh, a little bit of fun with code, right? But before we do that, what I want to do is show you the first line of this DNS log. Here's my directory, and I have a DNS query.log. I can do more on that, right? And you can see it contains a bunch of really useful DNS information. Now, if I take the first line of that log, let's do head minus one DNS query.log, and I take this first bit of information, I can paste it into a really, really useful website called pythex.org. Pythex.org is an excellent way to test out regular expressions. And I highly recommend you do this. Our goal, first of all, is to create a regular expression that pulls out interesting, useful information from this DNS log entry. Okay, we've just got one entry out of that log file in Pythex right now so that we can test and pull out information. I would like to go for the client IP address and I would like to go for the DNS resource record that was queried plus the DNS record type as part of my regular expression. Okay, here's the client IP address and this over here is actually the DNS server that was queried. We're not as interested in that. So let's start our regular expression. I'm going to say from the beginning of the string dot plus. Now notice what happens in Pythex. The minute I type a regular expression, it highlights everything that I typed that's being matched in the result. Now I did using a carrot, a hat, I said from the beginning of the string match everything. But what I actually want to do is use named subgroups to actually get me the pieces of information I'm interested in. So I'm going to say client here and a space, and then I'm going to start a subgroup with the parentheses. And I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to say backslash D colon three. Okay. And sorry, I didn't need this the curly bracket. I'll try to keep this short. Notice down here that in the subgroup we see match one over here on Pythex, showing that we've actually captured that first substring. Okay, if we continue, and this is not necessarily a good regular expression for a, an IP address, 
but if we can continue, we're going to make a simple regular expression for an IP address here by using backslash period between each one of these and then backslash D3. And what else? We need a 1, 3 because IP addresses can have between 1 and 3 digits, right? So we'll do 1, 3, 1, 3. And notice how in match one, now we can see we have an IP address. And what we've done is in real time actually created that regular expression, albeit a relatively simple expression for an IP address. And we can even name it using a named group. And we can see that match down here now says IP and then the IP address. Okay. So what we want to do is extend this concept out to capture all the other pieces of information in our DNS query log that we find useful for the purposes of our script. I'm not going to painfully type out the rest of this regular expression because it would take up the rest of the time uh, in the uh, webcast, but I will show you what I've defined in the prototype script. Um, John, is there any quick questions on that? Pythex piece. I, I think you just freaked out a lot of people by the fact that you typed it in by hand from memory. So <laughs> people were like, that was kind of insane. Um, David uh, had a good question. He said, is the pound prompt delineating the port? The port? Yes. In this particular DNS log, the pound prompt is delineating the port. So if we wanted to have a named group that included the port, we could say, backslash d1 comma 5 in another subgroup here and we would end up with a second match that give, gives us the uh, port number and we could even go as far as naming that group which goes to an earlier question that I think even uh, David might have asked um, that actually gives us the named group for the port number. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you. And we could even in regular expressions call that an optional match by putting the question mark on the end because sometimes we don't have a port. I think we referred to that earlier in the webcast, right? So that's a good question. That is a port. Let's jump to code um, I, because we could definitely get hung up in the intricacies of regular expressions in a very deep way, but I'd like to demonstrate how we can use those regular expressions to pull out the cool data that's in this DNS log, okay? I have two scripts here, one called bindlogstat.py, which is a finished bind logstat uh, parsing script, which you guys I hopefully can use and enjoy. And then I have another one here called parsing prototype, which shows how I built the regular expression to actually parse out all of the different named groups that we're using for this exercise. Okay, so here we have a regular expression in this section of the code. I'm using re.compile in Python, which is a way for us to pre-compile the regular expression to speed up the efficiency of the code when we're trying to match inside the uh, loop that we're going to use to read the whole log file, okay? I tried to break this out, so each sub-expression was on one line, so I'm using a multi-line string here um, that uses plus in Python to concatenate all of these together. Don't let that throw you. All of these different lines actually end up being one single regular expression uh, in this example. I know it's a little complex, but using some of the ideas that we just talked about, you can break down what some of these might be. So in this first one, for example, we have a named regular expression for the date. Okay, Inside that named subgroup, we have backslash D1 comma 2, two digits. And then a dash, we have a set, A through Z, A through Z, lowercase, and exactly two of those. That indicates for us a month indicator, right, in, in terms of that date stamp. If you remember seeing the example here, we have the beginning of a month being an upper uppercase character, and then we have the end of a month being two lowercase characters. There you can see that. Here we have four digits at the end. So this first one matches our date. Likewise, the rest of the name expressions matches a timestamp, a client IP, a view. In the case of view, it's either internal or external from Pythex. We have a domain name here, 
All I'm using for domain name is dot plus, meaning match anything between the query colon and the in string, i.e. anything between query colon and in is the actual domain name that was queried. Okay, We have then a query type that matches A through Z plus, which meaning match any uppercase letter um, for as many as you want. Now, I, I could have said something like one comma five there if I knew the query types were only potentially five long, but plus was sufficient for my purposes that should match uh, appropriately in this regular expression. Okay. Whoops, before we get out of that, let me show you a little bit more code. Okay. In the code, I do something that's relatively simple in Python, and I know some of you may be Python beginners, but let's just run through this. I'm opening a file. The file I'm opening is the first file that I'm passing into the script, sys.argv1, i.e. whatever name I pass into the script when I run it, open that file. Then I'm using a Python loop. For line in that file descriptor, try to match the regular expression that I compiled using regexp.match. If the match does not occur, if not m, continue, meaning go to the next line in the file. Otherwise, if the match is successful, print out all the different regular expression groups that I matched in the named subgroups in the regular expression itself, such as date, timestamp, client, view, domain, etc. In other words, in this prototype script, what we're doing is testing our regular expression. Now, if we want to try the script out, we can run it using Python, parsing prototype.py, and then pass in the DNS query log. And I'm just going to pipe it to more so that we can see uh, on the screen what it looks like. If it works, we should get date time, our date and timestamp, our client, our view, our domain name, and our query type. So, okay, this looks, I'm making it look easy, right? I have spent the time to go through and debug this regular expression very, very carefully using Pythex, which is an excellent method of doing that, and then using this parsing prototype to make sure that it works. And after I spent that time, and it took me probably an hour or two to actually spend the time to make sure that that works, then what I want to do is actually put that code into our final uh, script, which does something a little bit more sophisticated than just the parsing prototype. Let me spend a little time in the final script, whoops, not the parsing prototype, and show you what we're doing here. Now this Python code is more complex, first of all. This is not necessarily beginner's code. I'm using a class in Python here, and with that class, I'm actually having it do the same thing, use the exact same regular expression here in self.re. And when I run that class in my run method, I'm having it, instead of just print out this information, you can see down here I have debugging information to print it. I'm also having it use a counter dictionary here to update counts for the client type the domain type and the query type in the data that I match the regular expression on. Thus, I am actually creating a counter dictionary with different counts of those specific data items that I am interested in. Let's go back up the top for a minute. You can see here that I defined in the initialization routine of the class, and this code is available for you to study after the talk, okay? You can get it at the repo, the Bitbucket repo, which I'll show you later. These three variables are the different counter dictionaries that I defined before running the program. And then further down in the actual run of the program, I'm actually updating those three dictionaries after the regular expression matches. Once I have finished updating those three variables, I actually call a routine in this thing called print summary, which actually prints out the different types of counts from those counter dictionaries. 
that matched when I ran the program. Now there is extra logic there which I'll explain in just a minute but basically if you run this without any additional switches it will print out the counts of those various dictionaries to the screen from that DNS query log so that we can see what happened. Probably blew some people's minds then but it's not my intent. The intent is to give you something finished that you can use to study and work with regular expressions and counter dictionaries uh, later on when you get a chance to look at this material later. So if I run bind logstat, first of all without anything, it's actually going to print some help and it gives you some various options that you can use inside the code. One is to pass in a file name for the log file that you want to analyze. The other options here are different filters that we can use to actually change the code's behavior. Running it in its default state, I will just pass it the entire DNS query log and we're going to see that it will print out by default the top 10 counts, sorry, not top 10, top 5 counts in each of those counter dictionaries that we queried. Let me see if I can full screen this. Okay, so see we had top 5 clients queried here with a query frequency. We have top 5 domains queried with a qu query frequency and then we have top five query types PTR, A record, quad A, TXT and NS. It just so happens that in my DNS um, something is banging on me for PTR record answers from a prior uh, domain relationship that I had which I won't talk about but um, PTR seems to be a common <laughs> query. <laughs> Did you just say a prior PTR relationship that I won't talk about? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, that didn't come out quite right, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, that's really funny. So, okay, we can exclude some of those. So the minute I wrote this program, I thought, well, I don't like the fact that those PTR records are there. So I implemented a switch called exclude saying I want to exclude PTR uh, types in the code. Okay and not pass that in and pass in my DNS query log. Okay, so then I can run it again and I exclude PTI records from the counter dictionary and then I get just get the A, the quad A, the TXT, the NS and so forth. I can additionally in this code and these are just the extra pretty switches that I uh, implemented. Let me put that to the top of the screen so you guys can see. I can actually filter on query type Maybe I only want to see the records that are A records in the DNS log and it will filter just on query type. Now notice when I did that it only f told me the top five clients and the top five domains in the result because I is no point in it telling you the top five uh, query types because you know that the top query type is going to be A and that it filtered on the query type of A, right? So it's silly for me to print that information out. So just some extra switches that are in the code to enable you to do some other useful things. I also have a top end switch where I can set it to 20, for example. So instead of printing out the top five, you print out the top 20 queries and domains, etc. So you can see all together with the combination of a simple counter dictionary and some regular expression magic, we have actually created a very, very useful program that is only 130 lines long and most of that extra code in the program is not really about the counter dictionary or the regular expression. It's more about filtering these different switches that I implemented and actually the code that, that actually parses out those switches in the parser library in Python. The actual core of the code is actually relatively brief in just simply matching the regular expression itself in the main run routine and then updating the counter dictionaries and then actually printing out the result. So hopefully you'll find that is something that you can use in your Python in the future. I, I really, oh not present online, I really hope that you guys can use that. Uh, as a possible example of relatively good Python style, uh, PEP8 compliant. So please go fetch that. It is bitbucket.org slash jsthyre slash bind9 underscore logstat. 
uh, and take a look at that code. Hopefully that'll be enjoyable to you. And if you really would like to come learn a lot more about Python, I welcome you to sign up for any of the automating information security with Python classes. These are the three upcoming ones I'm teaching. I hope to be teaching many more. Uh, and you will get to do a lot more Python with me. Um, in particular, just to, to note uh, something that was mentioned earlier, the first entire two days of this course are about Python essentials that teaches you the language from the ground up. So don't feel bad if you're a Python beginner and, and think that you have to walk away from this webcast with all the useful leap Python skills to, to uh, be a Python programmer. That's certainly not the expectation. Uh, and so. you also get PyWars. We talked about that earlier. You get PyWars is just a self-contained game that um, will continue to drag you through becoming a Python ninja. So even if you don't get there right away, you're going to get those laps with you and take them with you. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, Pi Wars is a fantastic self-paced learning game that we include as part of the teaching material. Uh, we do it in class. We can also, we also give a uh, at-home version that you can practice with. So it's a really, really awesome way of learning Python. So hopefully you've enjoyed that. Maybe we'll take a few minutes for questions and then uh, let everybody get back to their busy days. All right, so let's go through the questions. Uh, we got a couple of funny comments. Um, I like um, Josk. I might be mispronouncing that. He said, even when you think it's not DNS, it's always DNS. Um, <laughs> DD put in and said, what if someone wants to view two Q types instead of just one? Uh, I think it, if somebody wants to view two query types instead of just one, I believe I put an extra switch into that code for that. Let's see if I can control my Windows machine enough to let me get to that. Hold on a second. Take another look, and I think bind log stat, this is another way to run the script, uh, also has, well, let's see, view top end, Q type. We have a Q type switch here which um, I believe will also give us that ability to um, do comma CNAME DNSQuery.log. And my code broke. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see if I can make it work. I think it was a space. There was something odd with this. Okay, there, there is a way to do it. I promise. I remember having to fight with this when I was doing the code uh, and play with it. But I'll, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I, I just don't have it on the top of my head. Maybe it's a comma. Okay. Anyway. Yes, it can be modified to do that, though. <laughs> yes, it can be modified. I probably need nargs in there that I didn't put in, uh, which I won't try well, to. you're fixing that, um, I'll answer a question uh, while you're changing your code on the fly. Um, is there anything we need to keep in mind when parsing logs that are very large? Um, one of the problems with Python is it's single-threaded in nature. And if you give it a nice, big, powerful box, that helps. But sometimes you need something that's multi-threaded. Um, and I, I really hesitate to say, you know, what, what qualifies as a large log file or not. Whenever you start getting to the point where you're dealing with massive, massive, massive data sets, where you're talking terabytes, it's at that point you probably want to start moving into C or you want to start moving into something like GoLang. Um, and that's some joking and some going back and forth um, at BHIS that we run into as far as what language should be used for what type of situation. So when you're dealing with very large files and you get something that's just, it's just taking too long for Python to parse, um, you're probably going to want to look into switching up to a different language at that point. The vast majority of things we have found can be solved very easily with Python. Um, prepping yeah. to learn, would you recommend starting with Python 2 or Python 3? I'll take that while Job is continuing to work with us. I would say about a year or two, two ago, you would say start with 2, don't go to 3 yet. But I would say definitely start with 3 now. Um, Joff, what are your thoughts? Uh, move to Python 3 is probably a good place to go now. Um, I think uh, Python 3 is a good, a good place to go now. Um, the um, the interesting thing is um, there are some oddities between Python 2 and Python 3. A tremendous amount of the code that you're going to see out there is written with Python 2.7, which tends to be the default installation on a lot of uh, Unixes, Linuxes, and OSX systems, for example. Um, Python 3, um, 
make some interesting improvements, um, but one of the big ones that will always catch people out uh, is the print statement in Python 3 uh, has changed significantly. In, instead of being a keyword where you would just print hello like that, the print statement in Python 3 actually is a function where you actually have to uh, surround it with parentheses. Um, so that, that can be a challenge. And there's some other compatibility um, challenges that you run into uh, with Python 3, um, especially with some uh, older libraries that may not have been written with 3 in mind. So uh, it can be a little bit of a, a challenge, uh, but we teach Python 3 um, forward uh, compatibility in the class. We actually do both. We, t we teach uh, uh, Python um, with, with 3 in mind in just about all the slide material we have um, and specific references that talk to 3 versus 2. Uh, in the material as we go along. All right, everybody, that's it. Thank you very much. And Ja, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. And uh, with that, we are out of here. Take care, everybody. Thank All you. Right.